I want to talk to you about the life of the Apostle Paul, and I want to uh, I want to bring a message to you called "See and Understand." We're going to look at three short passages of Scripture uh, before we really get going. The uh, first one comes out of the book of the prophet Isaiah, and in Isaiah 52, starting in verse 13, it says, "Behold, my servant shall act wisely." He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many, uh, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Now that's where I'm getting this language of see and understand. And Isaiah goes on, we're not going to read it, but Isaiah goes on and he launches into the famous Isaiah 53 passage right on the back end of that verse 15. And the reason he's doing it is um, he's setting the preamble for what will be the core passage of the Old Testament that addresses the subject of the atonement. Then we're going to look at Romans 15. In Romans 15, starting in verse 18, Paul says, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. If that sounds like Isaiah 52, 15, it should, because it is. <laughs> and then 2 Corinthians 10, verses 13 to 16 Paul writing to the church at Corinth says, but we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limits in the labors of others. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Well, these three passages are tied together and they kind of define the, the boundaries of how Paul went about what he did with his ministry. Near the end of his life was when he wrote this, this book that we call uh, Romans. It was a, originally just a letter, but of course it's been upgraded through the centuries and now we call it a book. But anyway, the church in Rome was not a church that he had planted. It was a church though where he expected as he came to them to find favor and to find fruit. And he was going to them as part of a wider expansion of the ministry that he had already been uh, undertaking in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, a generation ago, people would have um, taken Sunday school classes, whether at the you know, child or adolescent level or maybe adult education level, and they would have walked you all through the missionary journeys of Paul and you would have you know, learned all these things. No one really does that anymore. And so unless you really dig into the scripture on your own, you wouldn't fully understand all that Paul had done as he chased around the the eastern side of the Mediterranean, but his ministry was, uh, you know, came out of the Levant. It came out of Palestine. He was sent out as a missionary with Barnabas from the church in Antioch, and then he went north, and they planted churches in the center part of Turkey. After a bit, they returned home. Then he had a second missionary journey, which took him around the eastern Mediterranean. He went to Philippi. He went to Thessalonica. He went to Berea, Athens, and ultimately to Corinth, and then he returned home, and then his last missionary journey was when he 
uh, had his Ephesian outpouring, which was the high point of his ministry. But now, at this time, as he's writing the book of Romans, Paul is uh, under custody. He's been arrested, and he's on his way to Caesar. And <clears throat> as he writes to the Roman church, he says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. He says, by word and deed, so what I taught and how I lived it out, but also by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit. And he says, his sphere of influence reached from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. Now, we don't use the language of Illyricum anymore, so we would say today the Dalmatian coast, but it would be that part of the Adriatic Sea that is the modern coast of Yugoslavia. So Paul, in his missionary work, in his ministry, had traced a great arc. And he said, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. And then he sums up what he's saying to the Romans with this verse that I read out of Isaiah. I was I, in the version of the Bible I'm using it's relying more on the Hebrew translation, and it appears when Paul was writing to the Romans, he may have been thinking of the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, but he says that those who have never been told of him will see, and that those who have never heard of him will understand. Now, what was Paul doing? Well, he was saying that he would only venture to speak of a few things. He was giving a summary of his life because he already knew by prophecy that he was going to Rome to die. And so he was, he was expecting further ministry, but he was also trying to summarize who he was and what it was that made him do what he did. And so he said, this is what I'll boast about. This is what I'll speak of. Number one, that Christ has worked me, through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. That's in Romans 15, 9. And that he did what he did through my preaching and through my actions and through the power of signs and wonders by the accompaniment of the Spirit of God. And he said, this has been my consistent, unwavering focus from Jerusalem all the way to the Dalmatian coast, to Illyricum. Somebody who has that kind of consistent focus throughout a lifetime becomes, well, they become a force for change. Some would say they become a battering ram. And in some ways, Paul was a battering ram, wasn't he? He was not, he was not a milk toast kind of a leader. And he said his ambition, his focus had been to preach the gospel in places where Christ was not named, lest he be found to be building on another man's foundation. He didn't want to have this competition between ministries. But then he says something that's actually probably quite unexpected, especially to the modern ear, because we don't even think in these terms. And it's really that that I want to draw our attention to, he says his motivation was a prophetic word. And the prophetic word comes out of Isaiah 52, 15. We already read it. But that word was that he would carry the name of Jesus before Gentiles and kings. In order that those who had never been told and never understood, that they would see and understand. Now this summary by Paul's own hand of his own life, late in his life, is very consistent with what he had said to the Corinthian church, and that's actually why I read the passage out of 2 Corinthians. Because the Corinthian letter comes nearer the midpoint of his ministry, and it allows us to calibrate, it allows us to see the internal motivations of this, of this apostle, of this man, as he moved through life. He said to the Corinthians that he and Timothy, quote, were the first to come all the way to the Corinthians with the gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 14. And as their faith increased, which is another way of saying as they matured and deepened in what they believed, as they came into a life of discipleship, that would expand the base of the gospel so that the very work he had been doing would be catapulted out yet further into lands beyond. And he specifically mentions Corinth, and he mentions Achaia, which was a Roman province that consisted of most of Greece. And he said, I can do all of that without crossing into areas where others have labored. 
Now that's interesting that Paul can so succinctly summarize his life. And it, it, it I think, is, is in its own way, as scripture has a way of doing, it, it creates a, what we in the United States call a throwdown. It's a bit of a challenge to us. Because if Paul could summarize his life that way, how would we summarize our own? Because Paul is giving an account of all that had been given to him. And similarly, we might think, what will we do with what has been given to us? How will we give answer for that? Now, Paul was a pioneer, and you know, we know from just studying leadership theory that not everybody is a Paul. That's probably good. We'd all go crazy if everybody was a Paul. But still, there's something of Paul that, that, that speaks to us. It, it calls us higher. And so he was seeking to press into areas where, where others had not and were not laboring. And with that, we see what I might call the heart of apostolic passion. What does it mean to be an apostle? What does it mean to have that fire in your belly that could drive a man like Paul to do what he did? We might even say we can feel a little bit of the heat of apostolic fire, and with that, we understand Paul's why. You might be going, what do you mean by Paul's why? Well, when we speak of Paul's why, we're speaking of that which is their prime mover, their prime motivator. There's a man in the United States named Simon Sinek, and um, he did a TED Talk that you can look up on YouTube if you're of the mind to do so. He's not a Christian, but, but his TED Talk is called Begin With Why. And to summarize Sinek's work, he says our why is more powerful than our what or our how. What's and how's deal with mechanics. And often we speak of what we should do, maybe we speak of how to do it, thus the what and the how. But do we really understand our why? And when people hear our why and it resonates with their why, it brings alignment between their hearts, their passion, their energy, and they are joined to us. This is part of how we catalyze movements. This is how Paul managed to catalyze what he did in the Eastern Mediterranean because there was something about Paul that summoned people to follow him, to become like him. And so with that, we might ask ourselves if we've ever thought about it in these terms, and if you haven't, well, we could do it now. Is our why noble enough? Do we even know what the why is that gives us reason for existence? And if it's a noble enough why, well, is it worthy of Jesus? Will it bring him the fruit of his suffering? Because Paul was very motivated by this. He shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. He will silence the rulers and those of the crowned heads of glory. For that which has not been told of them before, they will see that. And that which they have not heard, they will come to understand it. So when Paul was converted, and we know the story on the Damascus Road, it's found in Acts chapter 9, Paul was struck blind. He was, he was brought into Damascus unable to see, and he spent three days fasting before a disciple named Ananias. We don't know much about Ananias, but before a disciple named Ananias came to him. By all appearances, Ananias is just some random guy. But he's a believer and he's living in Damascus. And the, the Lord Jesus appears to Ananias. And he says, I want you to go and minister to this man. I want you to go pray for this man, Paul. And Ananias goes, Lord, I've heard of this man. He's come here with letters from Jerusalem to arrest and to take away all of the people that are yours, including me. I don't really want to go see this guy, Paul. And Jesus says to him, go, Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, Acts 9.15. And so Ananias comes to Saul, as he was known at that point, he hasn't yet been renamed Paul, 
He comes to Saul, this rabbi, and he speaks to him of this. And when Saul hears this language, being a rabbi, he would have known the scriptures. It would have struck him. It would have resonated within him. There was no way he couldn't have known this. And it would have, it would have, it would have resonated within his heart as he heard the words, so shall he sprinkle many nations and kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has been told them they see and that which they have not heard they will understand. Well, this verse then becomes an invitation and a summons over the life of Paul that he would not only be a preacher, but that he would actually join into the very ministry of Jesus. He realized that what he had received was a summons into the life and sufferings of the Messiah himself. And so as Saul was becoming Paul, he seized a prophetic promise given over his life. You know, everywhere I go, people want prophetic words, but I wonder how many people have prophetic words that have been given over their lives that summon them to something like this, and they turn away because either they don't understand it or they don't pray into it enough or because they, they don't have a framework for what that might actually look like. So this was, this was a prophecy, yes, it was an invitation, yes. It was a summons, yes. But it also became something that overtook Paul. You might even say it ran him down. Because when a word from God, when a prophecy, a true prophecy overtakes you, it becomes a passion. And like fire, it will consume and devour you. And by the time we get to the end of Paul's life, by the time we get to Romans, really there's nothing left of Paul. He would say elsewhere, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. And so Paul is finding some sort of a, I mean, I don't want to sound heretical here, and, and please don't take it heretically, but there's some sort of a merge going on between Paul and Jesus in this word out of Isaiah 52, 15. And at the end of his life, at the end of the last letter of his life, he is using that scripture to define who he is and it becomes end-to-end -end continuity of what it means to live a life of apostolic fire. I think the church could do well to recover something of that. Because Paul lived with a promise in his mind and in his heart, everything he did was motivated by this. See and understand. Those who have not seen, that they would see. And that those who have not understood, that they would understand. People who know their why become entwined with it and they are captured by it. But to fulfill a passion like that requires seeking. It doesn't just fall in your lap. And it took a focused effort to find those who had not yet become a field of labor for others. And I would say more than that, it took more than a focused effort. It also took um, what Winston Churchill called blood, sweat, and tears. You think about Paul's life a bit. You think about the beatings. You think about the shipwrecks. You think about the danger on highways and on the high seas. You think about all the things that went on and you realize, yeah, you can, you can enter the kingdom of God all right. You can, you can see the fulfillment of a divine promise. But as Paul would elsewhere say to the, to the Christians in Lystra, it is through many trials and tribulations that we enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to contend for this thing. It's available. It's on offer. But it doesn't just come to us readily. I think I hear Ringo Starr singing, it don't come easy. And so this promise in Paul's life, it fueled more than a hobby. It fueled more than a volunteer commitment. It fueled more than a preacher's job. It fueled a lifestyle. It fueled a way of life that sought to bring the Gentiles, those who had not heard of him, those who had not seen him, to a place of obedience through word and deed, through preaching with power. 
You know, I've seen thousands of people set free as I've traveled and prayed with people. I was a little overwhelmed yesterday with how many came forward because I realized I'm only going get, to get to a very small percentage of these people personally. But notwithstanding, I, I've seen the, the work of God. But, but, you know, a lot of that was about the, the hows. A lot of it was about the what's. This morning, I'm really turning this into the why. Can we let that passion capture us? Because if it, if it does, there might be other matters that would need some exploration over time. But I can tell you this, yesterday we addressed the number one issue in the Western world today. We spoke right into the heart of the defining issue of all of Western civilization. You might say that's a big claim, but, but it is the truth. Kim Jong-un and his nuclear weapons are nothing compared to the issue of redefining family and sexuality because it goes right into humanity in the image of God. And everything that we have in our Western civilization stands or falls on that fundamental understanding, and I will tell you, it's in play. Is that a yes you're giving me back there? Yeah, okay. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't somehow <laughs> off the reservation. And so, as we, as we listen to Paul writing Romans 15, he's saying, I no longer have an existence other than to fulfill this mission. And in that mission being fulfilled, I am living out the very life of the crucified Christ who is now living and he lives through me and I live through him. Galatians 2.20. And so when we read Romans 15, 18 to 20, most of the time people use that passage as a missions verse and they've quoted it basically looking for workers to go to foreign lands to serve and to evangelize, to establish the church. But you know, having said that, and I think that's a fine use of it. I went to the Edinburgh Consultation on World Missions in 1980, sponsored by um, the World Council of Churches, and it was, it was a very motivating and envisioning uh, kind of event, and it, the, the effects of it still linger with me. I was in diapers at the time. <laughs> But most of the time when we read Romans 15, 18 to 20, we think about foreign lands. Maybe we leave Sydney and we go to, I don't know, Thailand or Burma or Cambodia or wherever it's going to be. Maybe we go to China or India. And I know a lot of Australian Christians that are engaged in that kind of mission. And it's good work and, and God blesses it and honors it. But having said all of that, I wonder... Just how many who have never been told and who have never heard are within reach of us right here in Seven Hills. I just wonder how many there are. Sydney, Australia is a city of about 5 million people. Obviously you're on kind of the western end of it, but there's about 5 million people in Sydney. And in greater Australia, we've got about 25 million souls approximately according to your last census. And here's the deal, 90% of Australia is non-Christian. 90%. And in a lot of parts of Australia, not so much this specific part, but in a lot of parts of Australia, the incidence of Christians is lower than in nations like Taiwan. Said another way, we live among the pagans. And they're all just right out there. And not only that, the nations of the world are coming to Australia. They're coming from every nation under heaven. Because you guys have a generally liberal, not in the sense of the party, but in the proper grammatical use of the word, a generally liberal immigration policy. And as a result, many of those people that are coming from places like India they're bringing religious traditions with them that are not Christian, and so the percentage is actually falling over time. And how many of them live within reach of us? 
How many of them live just outside our doors? How many of them live on our streets? How many of them are, you know, within, say, five or ten kilometers of us, which isn't that far? You know, Paul spoke in Romans of preaching in the power of signs and wonders, but signs and wonders, the supernatural work of the Spirit confirming the kingdom of God, these are not parlor games that are given to amuse us. Now, they can be quite dramatic, and sometimes it's actually quite fun to you know, be in the anointing and all that. But instead, we should view these things as strategic weapons that are part of a wider strategy of evangelism, discipleship, and advancing the kingdom of God. And I would add to that that you know, what we've done this weekend is we've given you tools to address the defining moment of our age. Because we need tools, we need equipping, we need to have these skills, we need to have the right understanding in order to be able to speak into the, 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 the circumstances in which we live. But those were all the what's and the how's. I want to go back to the why. Paul couldn't have written Romans 15, 18 to 20. He couldn't have written 2 Corinthians 10, 13 to 16, which says essentially the same thing. The grace of God was upon me and Timothy, and we came to you, and we preached to you, and no one else had been to you yet, and so we were the ones who you know, broke ground and established the foundation. He couldn't have done any of that without that prophetic word. He couldn't have done any of that without Isaiah 52, 15 that was thrust upon him. You might even say shoved upon him. When Ananias, an unknown disciple from Damascus, walked into that house and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road sent me to pray for you, that you would receive your sight, that you would be baptized, and that you would appear before nations and kings. And he couldn't have gone far with that prophetic word if he didn't have a discipled lifestyle, something that took all of that energy, all of that passion, and focused it. I almost said channeled, but then somebody would say I was a new ager. <laughs> but you know, here's what we know. Paul had a clear expectation that his passion would catch fire within the lives of his own disciples and converts. He had a clear expectation of that because to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And to the Thessalonians, a church he'd planted on the second missionary journey, but before he ever reached the Corinthians, he said to the Thessalonians, writing back to them some years after he had moved on, he said, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. You did what we did, and we did what he did, and because we did what he did, you did what we did, and because of that, there was a widening circle. There was a, there was a shock wave that emanated out from the church in Thessalonica, and it echoed all the way into Achaia. It went all the way into Macedonia. The Thessalonian revival was the second greatest revival in Paul's life. And I think the only reason it didn't surpass Ephesus was Paul learned a few more things along the way and he poured more gas on the fire when he got to Ephesus on missionary journey three. But there was something of all of this in Paul. He, it wasn't enough for Paul that he was on a journey to present Jesus before Gentiles and kings. He needed to have those that were journeying with him who had come alongside, who were born again through his ministry. He needed them to become partners with him in this effort. And he wanted their why to become his why. Well, that passion in Paul, it birthed authority within him. Now, passion alone won't get you there. It needs to be properly rooted passion. But I will tell you that if God drops a word on you, if there's something that is stirring in the, in the mind of God, and that word is released, you have one of two things you can do with it. The first thing you can do with it is you can let it overtake you and consume you, which is what Paul did. Lean into it, learn more about it, pray about it, actualize it by living it. Or as he warned the Thessalonians, you can despise prophetic utterance and let it go, let it pass away and let it be forgotten from your memory 
and it has no further impact upon you. And if you do that, the result will be that you will come short of your destiny. Now, everybody these days is asking about my destiny. What is my destiny? What's my calling? Everywhere I go, every channel I turn on, any church service, people are saying, destiny, destiny, destiny. I'm telling you, this is the destiny. See and understand. There's a global move of God that we are called to. And Paul was on the front end of it, I mean, 2,000 years ago. But see and understand sounds really good when we're talking about the Himalayas or the Middle East or something, but what about Sydney? What about the broken, lost people of Sydney? What about the people of this land who come from convict stock and have never known fatherhood, not for five or ten generations? What do we do with the immigrants that are coming to a nation like this? Well, authority is birthed not just from passion, but through service. When we go and we say, we know you have this problem, but we don't despise you because of it. We want to help you with it. We will serve you as you come out of it. But we don't lose our own charter. That's what Paul had. And that's really what we were doing with this material this weekend. Yes, we wanted to minister to the community of servants of Jesus. And yes, we wanted to see people get free right here. But more than that, we wanted to give tools that would empower the why so that we can speak to the defining issue of our time. Does that make sense? So God called and arrested Paul on the Damascus Road but here's another interesting thing. Later in Paul's life, he, he corralled him through a series of successive obediences. Now, you might not have ever thought about it that way, so let me tell you what I mean by it. If you study the story of Paul in the book of Acts, he's on missionary journey too. He's in the central part of Turkey, and he keeps trying to go towards what is called Bithynia which is up near the Black Sea. And if you were to have a map, he was trying to go this way. He was trying to go towards the northeast. I keep turning so all sides of the room can see it the right way. He's trying to go towards the northeast. And it says, but the spirit of Jesus would not let him. And so he kind of vectors back towards the west a bit. And he's trying to go into the province of Asia. This was one of the Roman provinces there. And it says, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask, what's the difference? But anyway, that's what the Bible says, so we'll just stay with it. But that didn't work either. So he finds his way kind of by hook and by crook down to Troas, the site of the Trojan War, which was itself ancient history at the time that Paul was alive. It had been fought more than a thousand years before. But he gets down to Troas, and one night he's praying and he has a vision. I think it's interesting he's praying. Because most of us at night, we think about sleeping. But you see what passion will do for you. It'll keep you up at night. And so, Paul is praying and in the night, he sees a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Come over and help us. Come over and help us. Now, he already has the fire lit within him. He's already got apostolic passion. He's already leaning into Isaiah 52, 15. But he sees this man saying, come over and help us. And Luke records of this event that Paul, in the morning, they concluded, this is the word of the Lord. This is what you might call rapid obedience. And so they get in a ship and they cross the sea and they end in Philippi. But without that passion, without that obedience to God, Paul would have never found the field of labor that God had for him because here's the thing. Paul wanted the provinces of Bithynia and Asia. That's what he was after. He was contending for it. He was he was seeking to go into those areas and God kept thwarting him and it's because God didn't want to give him a province or two. God wanted to give him a continent. 
The whole continent of Europe was effectively unevangelized at that point. There might have been a few missionaries that had gone here and there, but no decisive impact had been had in Europe until Paul crossed into Philippi. Once he got to Philippi, it was on. We have the several cities that I mentioned. We don't need to restate all that. But you know, Paul didn't have any idea what God had up his sleeve, and that's because God rarely unfurls the whole plan at once. So he was going to stand before many nations. He would see that the work of Jesus would sprinkle many nations, and indeed that happened. But he was thinking like, you know, just the Asians and the Bithynians, and God was after the whole of the continent of Europe. Now think about that for a second, and think about your country which is a whole continent. And think about the fact that 90% of the people who live here don't have any idea who Jesus is. Do you know only 30% of the homes in Australia even have a Bible in them? That's right. Now, you could say, well, but people could look it up on the internet, but they won't. And they don't. And you think about what's happening with the youth and the rapid fall off in belief among the younger crowd. And what you can see is that the secularism of Australia is going to get worse, not better, over time, absent a move of God. And the next 10 years are critical. And so I'm back to see and understand. Can we let the summons of see and understand overcome us and consume us? Can we allow it to make lifestyle changes, monetary changes, career changes in our lives? Can we do that? This morning I'm talking about the why because what I really hope will happen out of this message is that for a lot of people, it will shake them up and it will overtake their hearts and they'll say, wow, this is a leading edge issue. We can now speak credibly into this, but more importantly, we can summon the nations to see and understand. There's a lot of communities that are associated with servants of Jesus. They're sprinkled around the Sydney area, to use that word again, sprinkle. And so you will, or if you will, you could say you're strategically placed. But is see and understand animating us? Is it giving our lives focus? Because as I travel around Australia, I find a lot of Christians that are contending for, praying for, looking for, awakening, outpouring, revival, whatever they're calling it. But this see and understand, this heart motivation, somehow that's, that, that seems to have been tamped down. And I know why it's been tamped down. It's because we live in, a, in an age of unbelief. We live in an age where we are mocked. We live in an age where our faith is drugged through the mud. We live in a time where all that we stand for is treated as though it is of no value, but that is no reason for us to back up. Amen. It's simply a reason for us to double down and get deeper in the Lord so that we can draw from the, from the deep wells when there's drought all around us spiritually. And as we do that, we can look around us and see that all around us are people who have never been told or who have never been heard. Even within the communities that you guys maintain, of you know, many families living in close proximity, there are this, there's the odd neighbor between you know, this household of faith and that household of faith. Man, that ought to be like interlocking zones of fire. Those people should be like, <laughs> ah! You know, I'm either moving out of this neighborhood or I'm converting. But those are my only options, right? And, and so, but beyond that, pretend for just a moment that no other church exists in this community. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't other churches. There are plenty of them, and, and we're all part of the body of Christ. But, you know, many of them don't have this see and understand passion. They don't have the why. And so, if you can't pretend that there are no other churches, at least imagine for a moment that they've not grasped the apostolic passion. Because that one shouldn't be hard to grasp. And then ask yourself, what would it look like for us to take as our mission the reaching of Western Sydney, or the North Shore, or the beaches, or up into Newcastle, or 
I don't know. It depends on where the Spirit of God leads you and guides you. Like I said, Paul was trying to do certain things and they were, they were misguided. The Lord kept saying, no, nice try, Paul. Appreciate that you're enthusiastic, but that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. And then, boom, he drops him on the continent of Europe. What would it look like to take as the mission the reaching of these areas? Now, that requires a lot of conversations. It requires lifestyle. It requires learning how to interface. It learns how to... It means learning how to have a conversation with people that starts out very unevangelistic. It's just the weather and the lawn. And, you know, it turns into something because we learn to steer the conversation that way. But it, it also means that our hearts become inflamed with this very thing that overtook Paul. And it also is the very thing, by the way, that caused Jesus himself to come down from heaven to live among us. So we've talked about the what's, and I think they matter immensely, and I think they matter for the people in this community that have, that have suffered and you know, have experienced brokenness. They matter a lot. But if we lose the why, then all of this becomes just mechanics. And what will inevitably happen is people say, yeah, that was an you know, inspiring seminar, and some of us got touched, and that was good. But you know, we'll, we'll just let all of that sit on the shelf until the next time somebody comes through and teaches on that sort of thing. And so our, our shoulds and our oughts will start to become short-lived and they'll flame out. But if the passion that fueled Paul becomes our passion, if like the Corinthians whom he said, follow me as I follow Christ, if like the Thessalonians to whom he said, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, if that passion that fueled Paul should become our passion, then a great harvest, a great awakening is actually just outside these doors. It's waiting for us to go out and be the revival among them. Now, I, I go, I'll ba go back and say this. The, the hows and the whats, they matter a lot because we have to be able to do this well. But they won't mean anything without the why. And so the world is at our doorstep and they are waiting to use the language of Isaiah 52, 15. They are waiting to see and understand. And I'm reminded of the passage out of John's gospel. Some people came and they said, sir, we would see Jesus. There are people who are waiting for the answers that only God can provide. And they're all around us and they're hungry. And here's the thing, Jesus has no other plan. St. Patrick's Day is today. Oh. I was looking at... <laughs> it's a St. Patrick's Day in the United States. It's also St. Patrick's Day in Ireland. <laughs> but not for much longer. But you know, St. Patrick had a why. And it looked a lot like see and understand because you know, if you know his story, he was a man who was kidnapped as the Roman Empire was breaking up, as civilization was crumbling. And he was carried away into slavery and he was owned by a Druid chieftain. And he obviously had to learn the language of the people of Ireland. And eventually he escaped because he had a vision, or I think it was a dream, but anyway, that a ship was waiting, and so he traveled a couple of hundred miles to get down to the coast, but here enough, there was the ship. And he got on the ship, and he returned to what was left of his family, but there wasn't much left. And he was so glad not to be among the Irish. And then one night, he had a dream, and in the dream, he saw an Irishman, a Druid, saying to him, Young boy, will you come over and help us? It sounds an awful lot like Paul's summons to Macedonia. The very thing that took him into Europe. And so St. Patrick crossed back over the sea and returned to the Druids. And in his own journal, he recorded that he expected to be killed at any time. Because he was preaching against their Druid religions and so forth. But you know, it's recorded that St. Patrick, this 
this slave boy who, was, who had been kidnapped, found his way to freedom, and then returned to the very people who had kidnapped him. He baptized 120,000 Irishmen and started over 400 churches. It's astounding. But it shows you the power of why. And I use it as my closing illustration for that reason. Because even though Patrick didn't have any particular desire to be among those heathen, pagan, filthy, druid Irishmen. <laughs> Are there any Scots in here who can give an amen? I'm just... <laughs> Notwithstanding that, the why of see and understand captured his imagination. And the men who traveled with him, he had a band of fellow travelers, they captured his imagination and he literally turned the nation of Ireland around. He became known as the Apostle of Ireland. Apostolic passion in play. Well, I love what the Lord does when he ministers to us among us, but I believe God has his eyes already looking outward. And I hope that you will take what we've discussed this weekend and you will use it as one of the tools in your bag to bring, see, and understand to this city, to the state of New South Wales, and quite possibly to the whole nation of Australia. Because if enough people kind of get that apostolic passion thing going inside of them, I actually believe we can have the revival we've been looking for. Amen. Amen.